Ooh, all right. Welcome, everyone. Sorry, we're starting a little bit late. We were concerned that we weren't going to get Tom in the in the group today, but he's here. He's here. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Last Friday of September, if you can believe it. <laughs> Yay, September. Get out of here. Get going. Get going. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Becky Scott. I'm a head of community at Jump Cloud, and we've got uh, Urbishi, our technical champion. Yay! Tom Bridge and Sergi Bellissa, both friends of the show and has been here. Yes, they are playing with their new Sonoma uh, effects, and I'm so jealous. I'm definitely going to have to upgrade now because those are awesome. And uh, yeah, now uh, new toys, new toys to play with. So, I will uh, say no, Josh Carrot has has picked up my very favorite September, you know, wake me up when September ends, uh, you know, uh, reference there. So yeah. we'll get Green Day out of bed tomorrow and everything will be fine. Exactly. Yep. I was just going to say that when he when he said it. So, yes, absolutely. Or let let them sleep because, you know, who knows what October brings because, uh, although fun month, Halloween, birthday, all that good stuff. Woo <laughs> Uh, so we've got some fun stuff in store for you today. Tom is here to talk about Apple, and apparently there's some really cool stuff going on in Sonoma because I wish I could make a heart and uh, make cool stuff, but as like you this? see, I do not have I do not have uh, that because I don't get to make cool things. See, nothing happens. Mm -mm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, next time. And Sergi is going to talk about Android, so we've got you know, Apple on one hand, Android on the other, it's going to be really cool. Lots going on. But our usual schedule, we're going to talk about community. And we've got some I Make Work Happen uh, updates, including announcing a winner of one of our drawings. Yay! Give away money. And uh, we're going to go into product updates. And then, uh, then Android is going to be our main feature. So let's hop into it. A uh, quick reminder. Next month is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and so we're going to have a lot of topics each week related to those, as we said last week. And Halloween at the end of the month, we're going to be talking about spooky IT stories again. And I just spoke to someone yesterday, so we might um, manage to get a special guest on, you know, the one right before Halloween, uh, a cyber, local cybersecurity expert. So I'm going to try to make that happen, so I think that's going to be cool. I make work happen. Don't forget. Yes, I'm going to do this while the campaign is going every week. Go take a look at our I make work happen site. Uh, make a card. If you haven't already, tell us how you make work, innovation, security, any of those things. There's, there's lots of choices. Go, go take a look at that. Make your own card and share it. And when you do, you can enter to win our weekly and monthly drawings. And last week's I Make Work Happen is Jacob Lawson, friend of the show. So yay, Jacob, congratulations. And more to come. So make sure you enter those because weekly we make a drawing for $100. And I believe monthly it's, um, I don't know, like $1,000 or, you know, just no big deal. I wouldn't mind an extra, so uh, I can't enter to win those. So go enter and win for me, will you? Please uh, help me live vicariously. Uh, I think it'll be fun. Oh, and Meetups is moving into the IT social hour, and we are sunsetting the Meetups platform, moving over into virtual IT social hour, which it will be hosted on Crowdcast. And we just sent an email uh, last week, one more email coming out to remind you to move over and follow there so that you can get uh, notice notices when we're, when we're going to do those. And I think they're going to be a lot of fun. We will have some great conversations and uh, maybe even do some via Google Meet so everybody can be on camera at once. Uh, thank you, Irvashi, for sharing that but lots more to come. So please stay tuned. On the community side, uh, we've got some, 
let's see, we got some questions. Uh, one of our uh, members asked about redoing Authenticator on their phone. It, it's actually not that hard when you get a new phone to um, reinstall, but if one of you want to go and answer that instead of us answering it, please go jump in and uh, help out. Let's see, M. Cabrera. We'd love to have you jump in and answer that instead of us going in and doing that, but we're happy to. We just wanted to give you a chance to do that first. And then um, HT Grimmy was asking about printer access and security solutions in Jump Cloud. And I know that some of you have had conversations around that before. So if you want to jump in before Urvashi does, please feel free to do that as well. I know she's doing some research, but uh, we're always happy to have y'all jump in before before we do because we want you to share your expertise because we know a lot of you are pretty good experts in Jump Cloud. And then Sean Song, once again, he's out there throwing out some great scripts. He has a location-based dynamic system groups on a day-to-day -day basis script that he has shared. So go check those out as well. And I believe that is it. Yes, Arvishi Sean is a lean mean scripting machine. So go check all those out. And with that, uh, Tom, I think it's your turn to talk about some product releases and announcements. So I will yeah, hand it off I, to you. I was going to say, you know, the release that everybody's been waiting for, you know, is, is now available in Jump Cloud. Um, and yes, I'm talking about Fedora 38. Uh, we did launch Fedora 38 support on Tuesday. Uh, and so, you know, if you are out there and want to use Fedora 38 within your Linux fleet, uh, we now have full support for that. You could fool it before with, you know, with the uh, Etsy issue uh, file and, and doing all of those things. But we'll be talking more about uh, that in the coming weeks. Look for something on the community about all of the great things that Fedora 38 can do for your business. Um, we will also have uh, support for Amazon Linux uh, 2023 this year. Um, as well as, uh, and of course, I have to go back to my notes to remind myself um, exactly which distro, uh, but oh, sorry, Debian 12, because um, I didn't want to get the number wrong. So look for those in the next couple months. Uh, we're, you know, keeping things busy on the Linux front. We're definitely out there to, to keep the lights on for all of our Linux using customers. But in addition, I want to point people at the, uh, you know, the article that we put up on the community this year about our full support for Mac OS 14 Sonoma and iOS 17. Here at Jump Cloud, we strongly believe that release day support is the order of the day for anybody who's doing Apple device management. And so we are proud to announce that Jump Cloud is fully compatible with our, uh, you know, with the new releases from Apple. We are super excited for all of those things. Um, there are a lot of great features in iOS 17 and, I and Mac OS 14. I know that the one that I'm really excited for is the call screen. And so you can customize what other people see when you call, when they, when you call them, which I think is kind of rad. Uh, and of course, I, I'm in DC. So um, the name drop feature, you know, feels like natural uh, reality to me. Um, you know, here, you know, being able to share your contact card and that contact poster when you just get another phone nearby is a superb experience. Um, in addition, I will say that there's some additional battery life improvements that I've been seeing in iOS 17 once it gets through the initial machine learning pieces um, on, on my new phone. So I've been really thrilled with iOS 17 overall. Um, it's a really solid release for Apple. It's a lot of quality of life things uh, that are, are really well, welcome uh, for any iOS users, especially for those of us who live and die in messages. Um, there's a lot of really great features that are there. Um, in addition, you know, uh, here at Jump Cloud, we're really focused on the uh, desktop management more primarily. Uh, although we're going to hear a lot from Sergi in just a little bit about uh, our expanding mobile empire. Uh, the the Mac OS 14 uh, features this year are mostly stability and functionality. And so I've been running macOS 14 with Sonoma or macOS 14 Sonoma with Jump Cloud on my daily driver for a couple months now, uh, and it's been really stellar. It has been rock solid for me. I have not been having some of the usual issues for uh, you know uh, pieces there. So uh, look for more of uh, you know in the in the stability and functionality space. Um, and if you followed along in our announcement, you may have seen something brand new, which is our new login window. Uh, Stuart, I see your question there. When is the new login agent for macOS coming? And the answer is, of course, when it's ready. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't like to get hooked, uh, you know, hung up on dates. Uh, if only, but, but, you know, here in Jump Cloud, we're using it every day. 
So I, I was going to say, I live and die but with the, with the new login window. That is all that is out there. Um, look for something in the next couple of weeks, and you'll be able to turn that on if you want to. And so, you know, we're going to be doing some stuff in product to tell you all about that when it comes out. So you'll know by when you log into the Jump Cloud dashboard if, the, if you want to give the uh, new login window a try. So um, we're super excited about everything that uh, Mac OS 14 brings to us in stability, but also it you know brings some fun quality of life features like you know being able to react with confetti or you know being able to do the hearts thing and being able to you know it's there there are goofy good fun things in here as well. In addition, um, we've got some new policies that are out there, and for those organizations who are not interested in running Sonoma until it's ready for their environment or until they've completely you know, given it the full once over for testing, there's two policies that you need to be able to install. Um, you're going to want to be careful to make sure that you have your policy precedences set correctly and that you're not putting a bunch of different policies with conflicting settings on there because Apple devices default to the most secure posture, which in the event of software update means um, Apple considers a, a delay policy as less secure than no delay. And it considers a shorter delay period as more secure than a longer delay period. You may be you you may feel differently about that, and that is perfectly fine. I just need to prepare you properly uh, that you you're, you if you have multiple delay policies set, you're going to want to make sure that there's not a delay policy conflict in place. So in that environment, you, if you want to delay, you have uh, two policies that you need to use. One of them is the delay major version policy, and the other one is the macOS Sonoma install app blocker. Because if you set up the delay policy and your your user is tricksy and maybe uses a USB drive to bring over the installer app from their personal MacBook, um, they can run that with if they have admin rights. But we'll keep an eye out for that process and we'll block it if you've got that other policy in place. But be aware that it involves installing that policy and logging the device out from its account in order to do the in order to keep an eye out for that process. So. Um, if you don't want to install it, that's perfectly viable security posture, but you're not going to be able to block it for more than 90 days. So by Christmas, you're going to be supporting macOS Sonoma, whether you want to or not. So keep that in mind. You don't have long, uh, but if you have vendors who are a little bit slower and they, you know, there are a couple of security vendors who are notorious for only starting to test when they get down to the final released version of macOS. Um, maybe you should rethink whether that's a good company to do business with. But you you may be in that state where you might need to delay for a little bit, and you can with Jump Cloud. So there's good stuff out in the community post as well about what we're thinking about, what other policies are available that are new in macOS 14. And I want to call out, we are going to have a macOS 14 and iOS 17 webinar next month. And so if you are interested in all of the different pieces of functionality that, that, that are there for you and for your users and the benefits that, that, that they are, are focused on, um, please come out to that webinar. It's going to be a really great time. And we're going to do that on, I think, gosh, I, I stepped away from my machine, um, but it is all set for uh, Thursday, October 8, 19th at noon Eastern which for those of you scoring at home is 6 p.m. Central European time, uh, 9 a.m. Eastern, or excuse me, Pacific time. And for Irvashi, I believe that will be um, at, what, 9.30 at night. So um, we are really excited for that, uh, uh, for that webinar. Uh, look for us to announce a really cool co-host here in the next week or so. Um, and we'll figure it out and go from there. Uh, there's a lot of really exciting things in these new versions of the operating system, but it's so important that you test them. So I will tell you the one message that I'm uh, telling everybody right now is if you are not living with the latest version of the operating system as the IT guy or gal or person, now would be a great time. Take the hour today and install it over lunch and give it a try, see how you feel, how your tools handle it. And, you know, the other spot is, is great, I mean, would be to grab a spare machine and fire it up and give it a go. But there is all sorts of great stuff happening out there uh, in Apple space. And we'll have a lot more to say about some of their other enterprise announcements here in the next quarter. Sounds intriguing. Mm, can't wait.
I always like to leave people guessing and maybe wanting just a teeny bit more. Mm -hmm. Always wanting more. I love that. All right. Um, Kelly is saying, I generally recommend doing the upgrade in the week between Christmas and New Year's if you can hold out until then. There have been a few Mac OS revisions by then, and it's generally a slower time of year with lots of people out of the office. I think that's Maybe a that's a good piece of advice if stability is your thing and you know if if that's the primary goal that you have but the other question you have to ask yourself is what happens when I buy a new machine from Apple a month from now and it comes with Sonoma are you ready because that's going to that switch over date is coming I fully expect Apple to I don't know maybe Santa Apple uh, Santa Tim is preparing a brand new version of the M series processor for release later this year or for release early next year you need to be ready for those kind of situations. And that is a really important part of this. Yeah. And Brandon said, as I'm interviewing vendors at the moment for projects, I'm being very firm on OS update support for Mac. Very good idea, Brandon, because that's important that they have that in place. And also FYI for Google Workspace CX, Google Drive is apparently a bit borked and randomly moving files on OS 14. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. I'm afraid to ask how you discovered that, Brandon. <laughs> I will say, you know, it, it's been a little bit of an adventure as new versions come out. Sometimes unexpected behaviors are revealed. Um, so those are the kind of things that that, that can happen. Uh, I mean, I definitely heard, you know, a horror story recently from another MDM where they'd had uh, they they'd had their devices set up in uh, in the in the other in the other product and on upgrade to iOS 17 their tamper protection uh, saw that as a tamper to the device and issued an enterprise wipe to any device that upgraded to iOS 17. So test it's very important to test your own processes especially during the beta period. Ouch. Uh, Brandon is saying for, for those who are listening, since it's not on screen, uh, reports from other orgs. I haven't seen it yet, but we haven't pushed it out yet through the org. And I could understand why you haven't pushed it out, Brandon. Good idea to wait and see a little bit. Let somebody else be the guinea pig sometimes. Yeah, I was um, going to say, and there are a lot of great resources out there. If you're seeing something interesting in your environment in Mac OS 14, uh, pop onto the uh, community and post a thread and say, hey, is anybody else seeing this? This is a great place to ask questions, engage with your fellow Jump Cloud customers. Um, and, you know, we'll see if we can provide more information where we can on, on how that works. Yeah, Brandon, um, about the CVEs on OS 14, there's a there's a 10.0 critical that we were going to bring up in the... Uh, in the news to make mm -hmm. everybody aware of that just came out a couple of days ago, uh, just in case. So, but there are, I'm sure there are a lot more. I just happened to see uh, the super duper critical one that I wanted to point out to everyone, but definitely make sure you are keeping up to date on those. Mouse cursor shaking issues. Um, maybe, well, maybe you should lay off on the caffeine and maybe that'll help with your shakiness, Brandon. That's the best <laughs> I can do for you right now. Um, all right. So I think, Tom, if you are done with um, all set. that. All right. Are you ready? I'll come for back for Android? the news section, but I'll go off camera for a little bit. Okay. Sergi, are we ready for Android? I think so. Yeah. Awesome. This is exciting. So I'm going to pull up a couple of slides here, go through a little bit of a, just a historical reference point, as well as walk through and get to uh, the meat and the potatoes of what we're actually here about Android zero touch enrollment. So, hey, everyone, those that may have not seen me around, I'm Sergio Bellis, Principal Product Manager here focused on mobility. Um, wanted to start off with a little bit of a dis disclaimer. Some of the things that we would be showing here are either in early access or in future releases. So just wanted to make sure that you understood that some of the UI may change ever so slightly based on customer feedback or just internal modifications there. So uh, let's proceed then. Um, really at a high point, um, 
really there's a question often that arises is what is Jump Cloud's device platform strategy? Well, the objective there is to be able to support any and all uh, primary operating systems. In this case, Android has been one that hadn't, hadn't been around for a while in the Jump Cloud ecosystem. And we wanted to make sure we address this. When we look at Android, there's also this notion of how does it pair pair with iOS, iPadOS. So there's a very important value chain that we're trying to sort of deliver upon. One is the core capabilities, then building upon them um, more specific admin level capabilities, user-centric features, as well as afterwards the uh, sort of plugging into the broader gem cloud DNA where authentication, uh, user management is all giving a seamless experience. I won't spend too much time speaking in terms of the actual history of Android EMM or Android device management. It's quite prolific. There's been ups and downs. There's been uh, different management modes that have been introduced and deprecated. And really to speak to that, we're using the latest available and latest uh, recommended one by Google, that's Android management APIs. And with that, it brings a lot of flexibility. So when you're looking at it, depending on what use case you may have, whether it's uh, from that left side, you know, very privacy focused, all the way down to the right hand side where you're very control focused, uh, those there's a basically a solution for you. And I wanna say that uh, within the last couple of months, uh, we've delivered on work profile. That was our first piece. Uh, we then turn around and delivered on fully managed and dedicated devices. With that, and today we'll be talking about the fact that uh, streamlining some of those company owned devices or the procurement and onboarding of those company owned devices is generally made a little bit easier with zero touch enrollment. So we'll touch base on those details. But as a little bit of a recap, uh, in our phase one, we delivered work profile, BYO and core enforcement. Uh, being able to implement certain capabilities like passcodes, being able to set additional restrictions and drive really compliance in application distribution. I won't belabor every single feature here, but all in all, plenty of capabilities. If you're really looking for a lightweight solution to be able to give you know, some level of insight into the device, whether it's on a BYO device or a uh, lightly managed company owned device and be able to sort of uh, configure it to your liking. With that release, we actually did a significant amount of capabilities around application management. So we integrated the managed Google Play Store, giving you the ability to use public, private, and web applications, being able to uh, instantiate how you want those installed, updated, uh, all the runtime permissions associated with that. And then we very quickly shifted gears to the next piece that's really to hone in on our fully managed and dedicated devices. It was a sort of multi-phase approach uh, Really, those use cases, as I mentioned in the past, were really work uh, only applications or use cases, knowledge based workers, and then you shift into sort of a shift based workers. And those are your dedicated devices or your kiosk mode devices. With that, we really enhanced a subsequently a number of existing policies as well as added some additional policies, such as kiosk mode, battery mode, and some restrictions around uh, networking capabilities. A uh, couple of things to highlight would be system update policy was something that was quite anticipated, uh, allowing you to sort of instantiate for your fully and or dedicated devices, the ability to uh, update and especially also uh, when to not update that. Those were the appropriate freeze periods we introduced in case you're you know, going into the Thanksgiving holidays, Black Friday, and you wanna you know, make sure none of your warehouse devices go uh, in the middle of the shift start updating, that's a perfect time to use that particular freeze period there. As well as security being always on top of our mind, factor reset permissions, similar to uh, Apple's uh, sort of uh, ability to prevent you from sort of stealing the device or uh, just wiping the device. Uh, you can definitely set a, uh, a Google account email address that will have to be ver that will have to verify the device can be reset and re-enrolled there. So all in all phase two features were immense uh, and building upon our the foundation we set. And the one last piece that was part of phase two was a zero touch enrollment. So this is where we get into sort of the meat and the potatoes of this particular presentation. Well what is Android's zero touch enrollment? Many of you may be familiar with ABM or formerly DEP. 
and uh, you sort of anticipate a similar experience. Well, this is Google's response to that. So it helps streamline the onboarding experience, but there are a couple of caveats. Android Pi or 9.0 and above, Android uh, 8.0 and above uh, devices uh, are compatible with that or a particularly a pixel running a 7.1 and above. So there's certain versions that are starting to introduce it. So if you're looking at nine and above devices at this point, I would expect you to be able to, if you are procuring them through the appropriate reseller. So that's probably one of those critical questions to highlight or points to highlight that uh, Google does not currently just let you add a random device that you've procured at Best Buy or somewhere on Amazon and say, hey, I want to add this IMEI or the serial number to this particular portal. Apple previously was a little restrictive about that. They've added since then capabilities. Google currently has some uh, parameters around whom you can purchase that from and what type of devices. I think I saw a couple of questions pop up when I was looking around and we do have uh, a reference point there. So there is a list of resellers that are certified by Google. You can sort based off of how Google deems them a, a either a gold or a silver partner. You can specify based on your uh, the region or the country that you may need to procure that from, as well as the devices themselves. Uh, typically, these are merely rec Android enterprise recommended. They've gone through a certain certification level. For example, I think I saw someone mention about warehouses uh, if you're looking for Zebra devices, you'll find, uh, what is that, about 39 of them that are certified. Uh, again, we as Jumpcloud don't want to take a position of saying that this is a preferred uh, Android device. I think uh, there's plenty of Android devices out there, and each one may be most more appropriate for your use case. In that case, we ask that you just be aware of uh, that they're the appropriate version that will be supported. And, and from our perspective, we support essentially Android 5.1 and above, as long as it has Google Workspace or Google Play Services capabilities on it and is able to run the Android device policy application. So just wanted to cover those cu couple of bits by, before we proceed from there. So what does that particular process look like? Well. Generally speaking, there's a couple of pieces that have to fall into place and to make sure that the experience works out. One, you as a company will procure one, two, multiple devices from said reseller that I was just showcasing. That reseller, when you procure that uh, batch of devices, they'll create you a customer account in the zero touch portal. They'll upload those purchase devices and they'll essentially ship the devices to you or to the locations you've specified. Uh, you at that time are able to create a enterprise management uh, inter connection. And then in this case, we're talking about Junk Cloud. And once you've established that, you and if once we get out of EA, you'll be able to see that uh, experience. Uh, you'll be able to connect to your uh, zero touch portal. From there, you'll be able to pull in the necessary configurations, mark each of those devices on the basis of an IMEI or a serial number, make sure that they're appropriately configured. And once they boot up, once that end user gets that device, they power it on, connect uh, to the network, that enrollment process launches automatically and proceeds with the configuration. The end user will have to press a couple of buttons throughout that configuration process, but this is a way to streamline that there's not an option to somehow enroll or configure your personal accounts or avoid enrollment outright. So that's generally the process uh, that Android Zero Touch goes through. From there, uh, we've embedded what is the known as the jump, uh, the zero touch iframe in there. You'll be able to config link the appropriate zero touch account. So if you've purchased from multiple resellers, those accounts will all still be able to be linked all in one particular portal. You'll be able to specify that as the Android device policy controller application. You'll be able to even specify some of the support information in case a user is trying to. Uh, understand how it's booting up or having challenges, they'll be able to contact or email support accordingly. From there, I wanted to call out, there's a little bit of a uh, nuance of when we're talking about the reseller actions versus you as the customer actions. You will have, when you've procured those devices through a reseller, you will have access to 
the customer facing side. You'll be able to do certain configurations of those devices. You'll be able to map the devices to the configs. You'll be able to manage some user accounts as well. Whereas the reseller will be the one responsible for you know, uploading uh, those devices and assigning them to you as the customer. So wanna make sure that you won't have visibility to that reseller behavior or actions. You'll only see that transpire on your side of the portal. So let's maybe take a few moments and see what that looks like. And as again, a brief, a uh, little bit of a call out there is some of the UI in our console is early access, so it'll be subject to change there. But if you hop into uh, our Jump Cloud admin portal, you navigate under device management into MDM into the Google tab. If you've configured and established an Android EMM registration, you'll see, and you're part of the EA group, you'll see an Android Zero Touch enrollment card. Uh, we've been quite robust. Uh, um, We've articulated that experience in quite, quite extensively there. And we've already provisioned a number of uh, DPC extras in there. You'll see an embedded enrollment token that you'll be able to copy out uh, when applicable. From there, you'll be launching into the Zero Touch portal. Uh, this is already an integrated experience. So you'll see that it's particularly linked to Jump Cloud. Uh, it's already pre-selected the uh, work uh, cloud and uh, DPC, and you're able to specify some level of information. When you want to do specific device configurations, you'll be able to click this particular link. It'll pop you over into something along the lines of this. In this case, this is where you have the opportunity to build a net new configuration. This information is sort of for you to be able to uh, sort of recognize where that's set to go. There's plenty of options here from uh, the legacy notion of where DPCs were previously able to be built. Moving forward, Google restricts that to be only the Android device policy, which is what we're utilizing. And this is where you would sort of paste that, those device policy controller extras, extra bits. And it specifies how to provision and creates a longer live enrollment token from that perspective so that you can uh, whether those devices are laying around for a couple of weeks, couple of months, depending on your um, expiry time of that token, you will be able to uh, sort of boot up those devices after the fact. You'll specify the, that information accordingly there. So if we're trying to hop out, hop into an example, I have one here already specified just for uh, demo purposes. And then what you do is you come in here and you'll see your list of devices. Generally speaking, you'll have a default that it will link to, uh, and you'll be able to specify accordingly which configuration you want. As you have more devices, or if you need to do this in bulk, there are capabilities that Google provides. You can upload batch configurations, or you can download to make sure if you need to do some level of inspection of that information and then some lightweight user and reseller management that will be available to you on your particular customer account. So NetNet, once you've established this configuration and assigned it to the devices, whenever the, that device boots up and gets Wi-Fi connectivity or cellular connectivity, they will check in essentially with the appropriate APIs and start that particular enrollment process. So Coming back to that, um, we have, uh, we're sort of getting to a point where we're uh, addressed all th four major enrollment types as we denoted here. And at this point, we wanted to make sure that the company owned experience beyond just doing a, a manual or a singular onboarding or enrollment process that you were able to streamline them as well. So really that's the extent of where we're going. We're gonna have continued uh, efforts that we'll be building out based on your customer feedback here on how we can further enhance it. We have some additional already features that are in the works or under in our thoughts from that perspective. So excited to be back uh, at this point. Becky, Urbashi, I'm happy to um, gauge a couple of questions if there are any. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any in the chat yet. The one question I did see was actually... <laughs> Apple, um, but that was, I'm not sure when that came in. It might have came in before you started. Um, any questions, anyone? I, I think this is really exciting. Um, I know I've seen so many questions around zero touch. Um, 
previously in like the lounge and stuff and everyone's been been waiting for this so to see it finally come to fruition is um super exciting oh Stuart's saying etm is being released he said he missed that yeah so uh, we it's anticipate ending, within right? we are in early access at this point i think within the next several weeks uh we'd like to ideally be targeting by the end of october uh, obviously, customer feedback as customers are testing is influencing and making sure that we're enhancing that experience. So that may fluctuate that a little bit out, but ultimately available for you to start testing now. So that's a that's a good point. If you are not in early access and you would like to give it a try. Yes, so uh, we we've historically had. Our... I don't know. I think Becky's having some connectivity issues. We lost you there for a second, Becky. Is that me or come back? Oh, that was me. Okay, I. Okay, am I here now? You're there. Can you hear me? We got you. You're here. Yep. Okay, um, I was just saying that uh, you know, please reach out and we will get you connected to uh, to the program for that. Correct. Oh, and Stuart's saying yes, customers, please. Yeah, we've seen a number of customers reach out to their either account executives or to their sales engineers about that. Uh, if you don't have one of those or you haven't been in touch with them recently, feel free to shoot us an email at android at jumpcloud.com. We can also get you squared away there. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. And anytime, you know, if you if you want to just reach out to me or Tom in the Dang it, I'm frozen again. No, we're, you're good. We got you. Okay. My my face is frozen. Um, you can always reach out to one of us in the Slack lounge, and we will um, take care of you there as well. So, I hear uh, Ricky Jordan's uh, frustration loud and clear, and you know the private apps uh, and the and the and the identifier app name can't be something that already exists in the Play Store. That stings. I agree. Uh, you know, I think that there are definitely some some adventures there. And just read out the question because it's not visible if you're on YouTube. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he said, yeah, yeah, I was going to say. So he says that his only frustration with EMM is not Sergi's or Jump Cloud's issue, but private apps and the identifier or app name can't be something that already exists in the Play Store. Trying to get one of our non-Play Store app vendors to change their app name has been an event, has been fun. Yeah, that's, you know, get, anytime you got to do those kind of build build changes that, that touch the really low lying underlying pieces of that really, it, it's it's a difficult, it's a difficult challenge. Um, but uh, unfortunately, it's a Google limitation that we all have to work around. And I think we, we did have, have a question, question back earlier that we should, we should jump to before we before we forget it is, um, uh, Jonathan wanted to hear about JumpCloud's Apple Watch support and plans, and then sure. we can come back to some of the other ones that were in the chat. You know, obviously, uh, Apple has announced uh, support for watchOS as an MDM managed device and being able to do uh, tasks directly on, to, uh, on the devices there. We're still in our early stages of evaluating whether or not that makes sense. Um, if you have a watchOS story because, uh, that you want to share with us, my email is tom.bridge at jumpcloud.com. I would love to talk more. Uh, with the customers who are really interested, who are starting to issue their people Apple Watches, because this is intended for organizations that issue their people a corporate-owned iPhone and issue their people a corporate-owned Apple Watch. So um, be aware that that is the restriction that is currently available on this. We are seeking customers who want to do this kind of deployment. And there are all sorts of great industrial cases where this makes sense. Being able to use fall detection on the watch when you have industrial people working in industrial environments with industrial applications and being able to set those settings very clearly forward uh, for your end users is a huge possible story. But if you have a, uh, you know, a situation where you want to manage... Uh, Apple Watch devices in the field, whether that's you know an Ultra 2 or a Series 9 or any of the, the those watches that are out there, we would love to hear more about what you're after. So please drop me an email. I would love to talk more about this and really nerd out here because there's some really cool stuff that's included in this. Oh, Ricky asks a really good one. Will, uh, will it work with require username instead of just account avatars? Um, we are going to market with account avatars. Um, you know, we we understand that there are some organizations say, well, I I need to have this limited to, you know, just a username and a password field. Um, 
because of the way that Mac OS operates, because of the file vault login screen, which require which must show you valid users at that position, we are following Apple's lead here. And we are following Apple's security paradigm. You must have a user on the device. We are going down that perspective. Um, and that is where we are operating from. If there's a strong, compelling need to just limit this to username and password, um, we'd be happy to talk about it some more, Ricky. Uh, but we recognize that the file vault login screen is going to make that a real challenge for us because that is Apple's default posture is showing you a username and a or excuse me, users that are already on the device with their avatars and that we're just following their lead. Okay. For Android work profile, do you have a timeline on when we can use Jump Cloud Managed Device as a conditional access policy? You're in the right room with the right people. Um, and yeah. uh, I'm not going to take a date off of this yet. I'm not going to share a timeline here. Um, but know that this is something that is deep and uh, important to Sergi and I both. Um, in fact, you're talking to two of the three people who are really driving that forward right now. Um, and we are working hard to have a good time frame for folks um, before too long. Um, but I'm not ready to talk about timelines. And if we avoid the conversation timelines, I think the way the question was phrased was uh, device management or uh, jump cloud managed. So we're not just looking at work profiles, but we're looking at a cons like a uniformed uh, approach to make sure that any type of management, whether that's user enrollment or uh, device uh, uh, device enrollment, uh, profile enrollment, a a ABM, or even on the Android side, uh, work profile work profile corp, any of the permutations are appropriately supported, any registered use cases we're contemplating about that and making sure that that gets unified in those conditional access policies. So we'll uh, keep you abreast of that information as we have more to share. Cool. Very cool. And then Ricky is saying, sounds good. If we log in with avatars is fine, just curious after in the shell, how it will work since we already have that policy in place. Yep. Reach out anytime. My guess is if that policy is applied, we'll ignore it because it doesn't apply to the new login window. And also mobile CA will be awesome. Can't wait. Really Thanks, excited Dan. for it myself. Because <laughs> I, I you know it's funny, there there are always drivers, different drivers for business needs, right? And uh, you know, one of the things is, you know, I have this home phone that is Tom Bridges iPhone. And I would like to be able to put more things that can access Jump Cloud restricted devices on it. And in order to do that, we need better conditional access policies. So I'm knocking on that door all the time. Yeah, because we need a little bit of separation of church and state so we can access safely. Um, so yeah, that would definitely be a good time. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming mobile will work for BYOD self-enrolled EMM iOS MDM. Now, say that 10 times fast. We are intending for this to work with user enrolled devices as well as device enrolled or automated device enrolled supervised iOS devices. We are intending to make this work for work profile for BYOD and work profile for corporate owned development and work pro and fully managed Android devices. And then we're looking at what it's going to take to do the registration mode as well, where it's a totally unmanaged device. We want solutions for all of those things. They will not all come at once. Yeah, that registration piece will be interesting. I trust in your and mom. You, you, you she, I, I'm pretty sure your mom can grok this. If I went to her and said, Mobile CA will work for BYOD self-controlled EMM iOS MDM. She would ask me if I'm doing okay and then take me to a doctor. <laughs> are, are you having a stroke? <laughs> Is your brain short-circuited? Mm. Yeah. I think my dad, when he watches these, I think he skips those parts because he would just be like, Especially because he doesn't uh, use anything Apple and he would definitely be like, whatever. So <laughs> I'll probably get a call later. <laughs> All right. Good questions and stuff. We've got about 12 minutes, so we definitely have some news for you all. And like I mentioned earlier, if I can get my 
page to scroll down because of course it's not working to get me to the news page that I have. Uh, we did have some news uh, items. Oh, seriously, it's it's frozen. Irvish, you may, you may get to read all of them if I can't get to it. Um, we have a couple of really critical CVEs that we wanted to point out. Uh, CVE 2023-42657. And no, you don't have to remember these because we will put them in our show notes. Uh, in WSFP, FTP server versions prior to 8.7, Four and 882, a directory traversal of vulnerability was discovered. This is a 9.6 critical, which is why we're pointing it out because it's pretty high. An attacker could leverage this vulnerability to perform file operations, delete, rename, RMDIR and MKDIR on files and folders outside of their author authorized folder path. So attackers could also escape the context of the server file structure and perform the same level of operations on file and folder locations on the underlying operating system so go take a look at that one because that's uh pretty important and the other one where we were talking about uh sonoma cve 2023-40455 this one was a 10.0 critical and although it was um very vague it's still something you should go look at because the impact was an app may be able to read sensitive location information and the description from Apple's support site was a permissions issue was addressed with improved redaction of sensitive information. And it is actually fixed in Mac OS Sonoma 14. A sandboxed process may be able to circumvent sandbox restrictions. So make sure you go uh, look at those. And there were a bunch more. There were still some more around what we had uh, last week with, uh, I think D-Link was one that had a ton and there were a bunch more on that one too. Another uh, notice from CISA, People's Republic of China linked cyber actors are hiding undetected in some router firmware. So NSA and FBI and uh, CISA and actually Japan National Police Agency and Japan National Center of Incident Readiness and Strategy for Cybersecurity have released a joint cybersecurity advisory to detail activity of a China-linked cyber actor known as Black Tech. And they have demonstrated capabilities in modifying router firmware without detection and exploiting routers domain trust relationships for pivoting from international subsidiaries to headquarters in Japan and the US, which are the primary targets. So we'll link that one as well because um, these actors use custom malware, dual use tools and living off the land tactics, such as disabling logging on routers to conceal their operations. And so this is a pretty important uh, update from CISA and we wanted to call this out and make sure you are aware of these things going on. So Tom, if you want to tap in real quick about yeah, I, that since I wasn't seeing your note until I came back to the other screen. So go ahead. Totally fine. I was going to say this is just where I tap the sign and the sign reads, note, because of a dependency on uh, architecture and system changes to any current version of Apple operating systems, for example, Mac OS 14, iOS 17, and so on, not all known security issues are addressed in previous versions. For example, Mac OS 13, iOS 16, and so on. Apple made this statement for the very first time last year and said, we are going to fix things in the latest version of the operating system. And sometimes we will fix them in earlier versions of the operating system. We have seen updates to, uh, in the last, you know, 10, uh, sorry, 20 days, but to even operating systems as old as Big Sur. They can't be expected to happen that way all the time. And so when we think about this as, as security professionals, as well as IT professionals, we have to recognize that there are security risks and security costs to not being on the latest version of the operating system. That is all I'm here to do is show the sign, tap the sign, don't make me tap the sign, and I will tap the sign. Thank you, Brad. Yeah, absolutely. Yay. <laughs> Urbashi, do you want to do the next uh, set of yes. news headlines? Because my, my browser is being funky anyway. And uh, in some lighter news for everybody, uh, I don't know, actually, this may be just as bad. Amazon wants to charge a subscription fee for Alexa eventually. 
So during last week's event, Amazon demoed generative AI features it's been working on for Alexa and that it will allow Echo users to preview in the coming months. These features have the ability to have back and forth discussions with Alexa, showcasing its opinions, like a favorite sports team. Now, they are saying that there is no timeline on when Amazon will start charging for Alexa, but it, they, the Dave Limp, the SVP of devices and services at Amazon said, it's not decades away. So brace yourselves for another subscription fee. <sighs> Moving on. Um, News has just come out that Apple considered buying Bing from Microsoft. So Microsoft reportedly discussed selling Bing to Apple just a few years ago. And if the deal went through, Google would no longer have been the default search engine on iPhone. So Bloomberg reports that the discussions between the two tech giants happened in 2020, citing anonymous sources. And according to the outlet, Microsoft execs met with uh, Eddie Q, Apple's services chief, to crack a deal that would see the company take control of Bing from Microsoft in an acquisition. But nothing really happened after that. So, you know, that's an alternate timeline that exists somewhere in the universe where <laughs> Bing, Bing is the default search engine on iPhones. Um, in better news, your website can now opt out of training Google's Bard and future AIs. So there is a setting now where you can disallow user agent Google extended in your site's robots.txt, the document that tells automated web crawlers what content, what content they're able to access. So you can just take your website out of that training model. And I saved this one for last. Drum roll, please, everybody. Netflix is shipping its final DVD on September 29th, so today. And uh, that's going to be the end of that, marking the end of an era that helped make the company the streaming behemoth that it is today. So moment of silence for Netflix DVDs. I <laughs> that's all they right. already had. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that definitely gets the double thumbs down and, you know, the, uh, you know, the raining and lightning storm, you know, kind of situation i don't think i have seen a dvd in real life in a few years now so i'm amazed actually that today is the last dvd that they're shipping out i still see ben i really wonder what the movie is and, um, oh I that's know, a good right? one who is getting that i'm gonna check the article to see if there's information on this i, I still see bins of them on sale at uh, like walmart and target every once in a while all the time and, um, I still have a big old binder of them. Do I use them once in a while? If there's a movie that we can't find on streaming somewhere that my, my kids want to rewatch. Oh. oh, that's right, Kelly. The last remaining blockbuster is somewhere up in uh, Oregon, in Portland somewhere or near Portland. Oh, there's another bit in this article. Uh, Netflix announced that anyone who still has a rental will be able to keep their discs. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to have to just, they, they don't want to have to like, you know, recycle it. Where, where are they going to store it? I mean, they're going to, they would probably just destroy it anyway. That's right. Yeah. So. Oh my God. They can even request up to 10 more movies so that the company can clear out its stock. Ooh, interesting. I wonder if you're a regular subscriber, if you could still do that, because I haven't done the the mail in in ages and ages. Oh, Chris is saying Portland has Movie Madness, a far superior video store, 80K titles for rent, plus a movie memorabilia museum. Come visit. That sounds pretty awesome. That's really cool. We had one tiny DVD rental store, and I'm pretty sure that all of the stuff they had was like pirated. Like I still, jam quality. I still see those um what are they? Red box in oh, like yes. the grocery store and stuff. Yep. I still see those. Yeah, the grocery shop, you know, the other grocery store where I shop still has them. And I see folks renting there almost every time I'm there. So, I mean, there is something to be said for having something, for having some physical media. I get that. But well, yeah, because uh, the streaming services are ephemeral. going up and up and up. And so I could see just, you know, 
renting a movie is going to be a heck of a lot cheaper than paying for five, 10. It, it's, it's getting borderline ridiculous now, you know, um, we've gone from paying large amounts for multiple channels on, on cable to now paying for all of them individually. And it's probably more than it was. So one of my friends was saying that now there will be like a new Netflix that aggregates all the streaming platforms and then you can just pay for that one. Yeah, we're going to we're going to circle back eventually. At least I kind of <sighs> hope so, because it's getting kind of ridiculous. Um, and Kelly's right. Steam, streaming can also yank something out of rotation because reasons and now it's gone forever. That's the problem is when like Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime take it out of rotation that's why i have to go back to the to my dvds if, if i have it because um you know i want to watch it and i can't find it anywhere so it's like hey i want to lost boys as an example that was a, a movie that i liked as a teenager and i couldn't find it on any of the streaming platforms so i had to go find find the dvd so i could watch it for nostalgia re reasons um because it wasn't on any of the regular streaming platforms unless I wanted to rent it like it wasn't you know just regular for free luckily for me I have completely memorized my favorite movie Mean Girls so even if it ever gets taken off it lives in my head there you go shot by shot frame by frame what is it on is it on Wednesdays we wear pink mm -hmm. or Tuesday I couldn't remember Wednesday. which day of the week but I knew it's we wear pink cool see I, right. I realized that Apple or talking about that, I don't even have a CD drive anywhere that I like. I don't have a DVD player, Blu-ray player. I remember looking and you, Apple has a USB super drive, which still has USB A, which then you have to get, a, I think, a dongle for to connect. So I'm like, now you're paying 80 bucks for a, a device to be able to watch that DVD. So. I have one somewhere in my in my office. I have one just in case I do need that. But I, I do still have a DVD player. What I do not have is a VCR, even though I still have tapes. I got rid of the last of my tapes. I sent them off to be digitized. And so have done that and got MP4s back out of the deal. So that Good was pretty rad. I still have all of my old Disney movies for whatever reason. I don't know why they're just sitting up in a shelf, you know, from when I was a, a kid, but I, I mean, I they might go back into the now, vault. So you know never why. know. Like that is the whole thing. Like we're of an age where they were like, Oh, it goes into the vault. You won't be able to buy that for seven years. And I remember those days, which is why I'm, why I used to get those for Christmas, you know, like mm -hmm. whatever particular movie came out of the vault right before Christmas, if it was one we liked, I would get that for, for Christmas. So nice. yeah. Ricky's I saw right, a video on Disney marketing. Yeah, I saw an Instagram video recently where it was like some young person, probably still in like high school, who was like, oh, I'm using my parents' like vintage digital camera. And I'm like, but my, is my childhood vintage now? Oh, I have, some bad news I have not even a film camera, worse. it was a digital camera. And the digital camera was considered vintage. It gets it gets worse because gets so try better. try um, rotary phones and things like that from my my childhood when no one who is you know under the age of probably twenty even knows how to operate. I would them. say even thirty in a lot of cases. Maybe. Like I mean, I had, it's I been a long time. Phones. Okay. Yeah, in my. 30s. I finally canceled my mom's or my mom's slash grandmother's uh, landline that they had at their house. I'm like. You're still paying for that? I'm like, how many times have you used it this month? They're like, uh, well, I, this month? <laughs> I was just talking to my dad, and he, uh, and he was like, we were thinking about porting the home number to my to um, to mom's cell phone. And I was like, sure, you can totally do that. That's doable, totally accomplishable. Why? And he's like, well, her hearing aids work directly with the iPhone now, and they don't with the headset or with the phone. So, like... You know, it's so much easier to just pick up the call and have the hearing aid work directly and work better. 
So um, cool. they are thinking about uh, giving up her cell number, which they hardly ever use anyway. And, you know, now, you know, I mean, we, I, I rarely call anybody without doing FaceTime these days, at least not within the family. But like that way would, you know, that number just reaches mom instead. So I think that's uh, I think that's pretty great. And they get to keep their number that I have known since I was, you know, literally like three or four years old. So. That's pretty. Hard. I tried to convince my parents to keep their number that they had had since I was a little kid, but they did not. They they gave it up, and um, they were like, "Well, you can you can go get a phone and get it if you want it, but we don't want it." Um, but they do not have um, Apple devices; they have Android, so we are incompatible, and we cannot FaceTime. I'm sorry. Um, I know that's what I, WhatsApp I, is for. I've tried. Irvish, she has the point. WhatsApp is kind of the jam. I definitely have, have learned to love moving the group text to WhatsApp if you have multiple uh, platforms involved. So. Yep. I, it's a lost cause. I, they, they do text, but getting WhatsApp or something like that, I can't. Um, you have to download a whole new them. app and then like configure it. It's too many things. Yeah. He, he just hates all those extra apps. Um, and downloading extra things. He tries to delete everything off of there that he can. That's not absolutely necessary. So that would be one. He, he tried to delete his e email and everything off of there. And I'm like, you need that to log into the Android stuff, dad. You can't do that. You actually need that. So yep. now Friends, I'm definitely getting a phone call. Yeah. yeah I need we, to turn into gotta, a we've pumpkin. We've got to cut it off because we are past time. But uh, good to see everybody. And uh, happy Sonoma Week and iOS 17. And uh, I'll see you guys next time. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. We will see you. Oh, and Ricky is going to be our guest next week for I Make Work Happen. And we are super excited about that. And it's going to be a good time. So looking forward to uh, seeing you all next week and starting Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So take care, everyone. See you next time.